Hi, I'm Dr. Joel Kreisberg, and I'm here to talk to Tim Owens, a certified homeopath, about his experience with inspiring homeopathy. Tim, welcome. Hi, Joel. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Um, you've been, you know, working with inspiring homeopathy for a while. So tell us a little bit about your experience with inspiring homeopathy. Uh, yeah, it, it was a kind of a roundabout way that I got involved with it. Um, like many homeopaths, I spend a lot of time online reading whatever articles I can gather. And around about 2002, 2003, I ran across an article by a man named Tina Smits on the subject of carcinosin. When I read the article where he described the Materia Medica of carcinosin, it struck me as some of the best writing I'd ever read on the subject of Materia Medica in general, and what he said about carcinosin was brilliant and insightful. Now, bear in mind, of course, I'm an English teacher, so I pay attention to the writing of things, and I thought, this guy's really extraordinary. He really knows how to teach a remedy. And so I read through his Materia Medica and then started to apply it in my practice, and I found that the guide markers he left in his article uh, explaining how to see this remedy were extraordinarily accurate and useful. I read a lot of Materia Medica and much of it is very difficult to apply, but what struck me about Tinas is he understood how homeopaths think and he also understood how to convey it in a way that you could just walk into your clinical setting and go right to work with it. So I enjoyed a whole bunch of success using carcinosin on the strength of his writing. And I got more and more curious about him and continued to read. And I, I remember telling a colleague about, you know, my fun with this guy. She went all the way to Europe and studied with him. When she came back, she had caught fire. And she said, Owens, you have to go. And I, you know, I got two kids, I got a full-time job. I'm not anxious to travel to Europe. On the other hand, the way she talked about it sounded so exciting, so intriguing, that I got a plane ticket, rented a room in a jeet, and flew to Europe and spent five days at Tinas's, um, uh, he had a, a villa in the south of France in the Dordogne region, and he conducted his class out on the back veranda looking out over a sheep pasture. And for five days, he conducted one of the most fascinating courses I've ever been involved in, head and shoulders over any other homeopath I ever watched. And so from what I understand, that workshop and that style is you take the remedies. That kind yeah. of what Tinas was absolutely insistent that you don't learn hot homeopathy in any other way than experiential. And mm -hmm. so he insisted that in some capacity, when you study the remedy, you start by taking the remedy. Now, the course is roughly four and a half days long, and you need to take eight remedies. And when I did the math, I said, that's crazy. If you're going to prove a remedy, you take it and you wait a couple of months and you extract all this information and carefully. And that's not how Tinas did things. What Tinas did was have you take the remedy in whatever way you chose. You could eat it. You could sniff it. You could hold it in your hand. It was your choice. He didn't press anybody to do that. But once you took the remedy, it was fascinating. You would experience the remedy. You would feel it working through you. And then the entire class would bring out a picture of the remedy. And the part that was incredible to me was that when the class was over, the remedy would shut off, mm -hmm. almost like somebody told it to. Mm -hmm. So you would go for an hour and a half, two hours, and then, and then you'd walk out of the place and say, I was living inside that remedy, and now as I'm walking back to my room, I'm fine. Wow. And I did that eight times in four and a half days mm -hmm. and went home and was blown away by this method of learning. And so how would you say that taking remedies changes your understanding of, let's say, the remedy first? How, how, does remedy, how do you understand Materia Medica differently once you've taken a remedy? You work as a good homeopathic cure would work from the inside to the outside. So the way Tina's constructed the class 
you would begin with a little, you know, a little chat and you'd get comfortable and everybody would be sitting in chairs in a circle. And then he would hand you the vial with the remedy. And some people would open the cap and sniff it and then pass it to the next person. And that person might tap some pellets out and they would even, some people would just hold it in their hands and close their eyes and, and so on and so forth. But once you took the remedy, then he would say, all right, we'll all close our eyes. And then you would meditate for 15 or 20 minutes and let the remedy do whatever it did. Mm -hmm. And while you meditated, you would be collecting experience on the inside. Mm -hmm. Once that was completed, he would bring us out of that little meditation. And then he would say, does anybody want to share anything? And then it would just be this guy over here would bubble up with something and he would talk for a little bit and then somebody else would get the itch and they would start to talk. And pretty soon everybody in that circle would share the feeling of the remedy and very gradually the whole picture of the remedy would emerge and it would become a group experience. Mm -hmm. So you didn't, it wasn't like reading a book. It was like sitting inside the space of carcinosin or vernix cassiosa or lac maternum, everybody in that site would just reside inside of it. At mm. the very end of that experiential part where we, we would discuss the remedy, almost reluctantly, Tinas would then pull out his notes and he would tell us, keynotes and symptoms and things that he had seen and cured with the various remedies. And then he would often offer some cases to show us how it worked. So we would go from that internal subjective into that external objective. And by the time you finished the class, which was about an hour and a half or two hours, you left with this deep feeling of the mm -hmm. remedy. Again, as a teacher, I found it extraordinary. Nice. And, and then how does that, does the, so do the remedies kind of show up differently in your practice from that point on? I mean, do you, know, do, do you use them differently or do people come in and you see things differently? I mean, what is your experience? My experience has been that, and I don't think this is unique to me. I think this is true of all homeopaths. We have certain remedies that really talk to us. And if you've read Tina Smith's books, you'll know at one point he describes how homeopaths resonate with certain remedies. And in addition, their clients resonate to them and to those remedies. So the people who need carcinosin seem to find people that resonate with carcinosin. The people who need vernix cassiosa find the people that resonate with vernix cassiosa. In my case, there were certain of the remedies that, that became my friends and that I'm very comfortable with and that I see on a fairly regular basis. Mm -hmm. There are others that are relatively inaccessible to me that I have used sometimes with success or minor success and sometimes I can't figure out how to make it work. But again, I don't think that's particularly unique to a homeopath. Each of us has certain energies that we're just really comfortable with. In my case, of course, it's carcinosin and carcinosin cum cuprum. I love those remedies. Mm -hmm. Interesting, I, you know, because two of the remedies are very common remedies, rust toxin and anacardium. Did it change your, how those got used or did very you? So. Yeah, well, I had, like many homeopaths, used Roos primarily as a an acute and or a musculoskeletal, superficially, I didn't really have much of a handle. After that seminar, when I came home, Roos is one of my favorites, and I use it no. regularly. Yeah, me too. Um, the picture that he drew out of Roos is an extraordinarily universal one, and Roos is an extraordinarily deep remedy. And I think every homeopath needs to go way into Roos because it's all over the place right now. And likewise, anacardium, oh, dear Lord, for me, that's everywhere. I see when Anna, he taught us about anacardium and the split. Mm -hmm. And I experienced that. I had a very lively experience. In fact, if you read the foreword to his Inspiring Homeopathy, I wrote about my experience with anacardium. It knocked my socks off for almost exactly 60 minutes, and then it disappeared. 
as mm -hmm. Tinas would say, like snow in the springtime sunshine. Mm -hmm. And I w came away from that with the, just an extraordinary understanding of it and the ability to use it with some regularity in my practice uh, for all sorts of cases where people are terribly stuck. So it's interesting. So what you're saying is there's some new remedies that, you know, are, are unfamiliar with. There's some remedies that, that Tina's created himself, carcinosum cum cuprum. And there's some old remedies that your understanding of the remedies has completely changed because Absolutely. you yeah. took the remedy. And a lot of people have taken rust tox for, you know, their sprained ankle or maybe they're acute, this and that, or poison oak or poison ivy. But this is really a constitutional use for... It is a huge remedy. It is a solid crest of the first order. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, once you climb inside of it, you come out with a new respect for it. And after you get a few cases where somebody comes in and it's almost incidental, yeah, I have a stiff this or a sore elbow or whatever, the real story is essentially the horror of their childhood yeah. or the horror of the trauma that brought them to the point where they needed roofs. So it is a it is a huge remedy for all sorts of traumas, deep traumas, and it's mm -hmm. incredible when it works. So what I appreciate about the system is it's seven remedies. I mean, you're describing eight because there's two versions of carcinosum cuprum, but there's seven universal layers. And so it's a kind of a closed system with the potential for being an open system because it's not superseding constitutional classical form. It's saying, oh, here's a different piece. And we're not going to go too far in that conversation today. But you ended up editing the book and you mentioned your forward. So you ended up working with Tinas as a writer. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a, a school teacher. I was a high school English teacher for 29 years. And right here, I'll show you the copy. This is the original copy of his Inspiring Homeopathy, which was uh, like a pamphlet. It was, you know, as cheap as you could make it. And I got a copy of it and read it from cover to cover, marked it all up, made notes, used it constantly in my practice. But the whole time I was using it, I kept saying to myself, you know, it really would be nice if English were his first language because um, the, the, the problems with the language were a real problem for a fuss budget English teacher. I would read it and say, oh, gee, Tinas, that's not how Americans use adverbs. That's not where you put that word. And where did you get that construction? So when I was over in, um, in the Dordogne with him at his villa, at the end of the course, uh, I told him how impressed I was with his teaching, with his method, with his understanding, with the experience. I had I just lavished praise on him because I thought he was extraordinary. And I said, Tinas, I personally think that what you're doing is an incredibly important gift to the homeopathic community, but uh, <laughs> it really needs some serious editing. And I said, I would like to volunteer to be the editor. I don't need a dime for it. I would like to do it as just a, a gift to you and to the universe. And he said, oh, well, uh, okay. But he was nervous because the book was his baby. And he was really nervous about letting go of it. And he doesn't know me other than my time in his little class. And here I am back in upstate New York claiming I'm going to fix his book. But what if I take it over and change it and... And so we had regular conversations by emails and I began editing the book and then I would send the copy back with my notes and with questions and whatever. And over the course of maybe a month or two, he gradually came to realize that I respected his material and that as an editor, I was not going to take it over. And anytime I had any kind of substantive change in his text, I would send it over to him and I'd ask all kinds of questions and then I'd explain why I changed it and why an English speaker would struggle with the way he explained it. And eventually I would say after a couple of months, he just gave me carte blanche and he said, I trust you, fix it. So I spent, oh, I don't know, every, every spare vacation I had, a lot of weekends, I would sit down and edit, send him a chapter and he would look it over and then he would send back notes and he would say, yeah, that's good, let's go. And I I worked my way all the way through inspiring homeopathy. And by the time I got towards the end, he said, I've been working with these autistic kids and I would like to write a book about that. So <laughs> right at the end of it, he starts sending me a new set of notes. So the upshot of it was I wound up editing the second book before I finished the first. I edited both of those. And then tragically, of course, Tina's died. I believe it was in 2011 and they, 
the books never got published, which was very frustrating. And eventually a colleague of mine came along and had worked with his, uh, his son. And we finally finished the edits, shipped them off, got the books published. Here is a hardcover copy of it. In fact, this was my final payment when I finished editing. I said, send me some copies of the book. That's all I want. So I have a bunch of these lying around. In fact, I think I sent you one. Mm -hmm. But um, they did finally get published, and I think uh, they are books worthy of anybody's homeopathic library. Mm -hmm. They're classics. I agree. Yeah, so we have a book and you have a process, and then now we start to go off and do it again. So, you know, the next stage is, is we're, you know, we've been teaching. You and I have been teaching together for a long time. Indeed. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, so I started doing uh, these, these journey of homeopathy, inspiring homeopathy groups as well, because I find it a great way of learning. And, and actually, it's, so we're about to launch into another one of those, and I believe you're going to be joining me on the next journey of inspiring homeopathy. Well, as a matter of fact, in the same way I followed you all the way through teleosis and your various incarnations as a teacher, I can't miss this, Joel. I think this is going to be fascinating. And so I'm curious what we're doing with this particular version is we're doing it online. And I had you take a class with me before, you know, recently so you could see what it's like to work online in these two formats. This is a Zoom format we're using right now. And also we use Moodle format for conversations. And so what's your been experience of being in a class that's online? You know, how does it work? Well, let me preface everything I say by saying we are people who give sugar pills to people who are suffering. And the sugar pills have been impregnated with magic solution that has nothing in it. And lo and behold, they get better. So when somebody says, let's try to do what Tinas did in the south of France in his lovely villa online, I say, why not? That's, that's not even a stretch. Um, homeopathy de defies time and space. And this teaching will travel quite nicely through the airwaves. So... I think this is going to be just a fabulous way to do it. When I did your previous class, I had absolutely no problems with connections or understanding. And I also like the group dynamic that is generated by some of the cyber toys that have been created in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's been my experience too. In other words, this is real time for us. So we're all in this group together. If there were 10 of us, we'd all be having this conversation. That's right. And it feels like, and I can stay at home so I don't have to travel. I mean, it'd be fun to go to the door diner. Yes, it would. I, I would recommend it, but it's frightfully expensive and a royal pain to get there. <laughs> But the other piece is what was interesting is that we also use this online component for conversations, okay? And that was a, that has a little bit uh, it takes a little bit more learning curve because you really have to kind of log into the Moodle site. But you know, my experience has been is adults really have a very deep conversation when you put them in. It's a little bit like Facebook, but it's its own unique classroom where we're able to converse with each other. You have to recreate that circle, and you have to recreate that energy. And it is an energy, and it travels across the boundaries of time and space with absolutely no difficulty. And right. if you practice homeopathy for any length of time, that's not a stretch. Right. So, and, and, and what the, I've come up with this particular design is, you know, that we don't modern, we don't have a week to give most people to do a retreat like this. And often inspiring homeopathy gets turned into a weekend workshop. Then you're taking seven or eight remedies in two days. And I found that to be kind of rushed. So now you really get to work with a remedy and be in a group that's staying connected. Four and a half days was very tight. I mean, yeah. we marched. Right. It worked. But it would be hard for me to imagine doing it in less time. If anything, I'm, it would have been lovely to stretch another day. Right. So in this design, we're going to all be together on an hour and a half call. We're going to take the remedy. We're going to meditate with the remedy. We're going to share our experiences. But then we're going to keep sharing our experiences as a group that's woven together online. That's, you know, in asynchronous time. Come back again a week later. Check in. What Anything else we learned from Lac Maternum? And then pause. Ring the bell. Smudge. And then <laughs> on to Vernix. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, if, if you're, you know, if you're looking at this, perhaps you're interested in the class. The class has still has a few slots left. It's going to start April 21st. It's uh, it actually at this point is going to be 8 p.m. Eastern time, which is 5 p.m. California time. And, um, you know, it's, I'm excited that Tim is going to be joining me in the process of sharing our experience. And I look forward to having any of you join us. And thank Tim, thank you for taking the time. It was my pleasure, Joel.